And one of the things that we have on here is uh, an Army publication where um, the, the military used to have educational material teaching people, certainly teaching their officers what the difference was between a democracy and a, uh, a, a republic. So um, for some reason, oh, here it is. So you click on it. So this, yeah, this, they, they go into what citizenship is. And they point out that the citizenship always leads to a dictatorship or anarchy, but it, it, it does not lead to freedom. When you, when you in, a, in a republic where you're sovereign, where you can suspend the rules on your own authority, uh, so long as you do not impose on the sovereignty of someone else, well, that leads to freedom because when the rules become obnoxious, you can just say, forget it, I'm not going to obey it. That's the beauty of a republic. And the, the founding fathers had a confidence in the public at large. They, they, they believed more in the people than they did in, in the specialists running government because they knew how human nature is and how government nature is. So anyway, this is, uh, this is the, the publication by the military, very short. Training manual number 2000-25, and you just click on here, and we got a copy of it. It's on a, uh, it's in a word processor file. There it is. War Department, 1928. That was back when they uh, believed in it. Yes. Okay, but anyhow, so they, they go into what citizenship is, and they go into all sorts of stuff, but as it relates to the military. But it's interesting, they, don't all, they no longer publish that manual, I understand, because basically they're trying to convert this over to a democracy. We go to the, the uh, essay category on this CD, under essays, I think this is where it is. We have, um, here we are. In 1792, uh, Philip Freneau wrote an article in his newspaper on how to, uh, he wrote the rules for changing a republic into a monarchy. And of course, the intermediate step <coughs> would be a democracy. So he, has, he lays out the whole plan, and if you take the time to read it, you'll see that's exactly what they've done. The one thing that's happening today that was never anticipated by the Founding Fathers was the arrival of the Internet, electronic communications. Never in the history of the world that we know of <clears throat> have we ever had the high-speed communications. And I'm sure a few of you certainly I do, have a mailing list of people you send out interesting things to, jokes or whatever, and for communicating. Well, that's the power of the press, personalized. You can duplicate your thoughts and, and send them out en masse mm -hmm. for a fraction of a cent. That's pretty good. So <clears throat> it's an interesting, you know, knowing my history as I do, which isn't all that great, but the little bit of history I do know, I think there's an interesting race going on between the government doing its natural thing, which is taking over its own people, versus the people becoming awake and doing something about it before it happens. And I'm not sure which side's going to win, but I'll say one thing, the internet certainly upset the formula. <laughs> you know, it <clears throat> anyhow, so there's that. Back to the foundation here. Okay, when California was admitted to the Union, it had to be a republic. So here's, the, here's a copy of the admission. And they say, whereas the people of California presented a constitution and asked admission into the Union, which constitution was submitted to Congress by the President of the United States by message date February 13, 1850, 
and which on due examination is found to be Republican in its form of government, being enacted by and so forth, and they went and admitted this, the state into the union. So all the states have to go through this process because the, the <coughs> Constitution for the United States demands it, mandates it. They have to be a Republican form of government before they can join. Let's talk about a court. What is a court? <clears throat> There's a couple of definitions. One of the definitions is legal, and the other one's practical. Okay? So, <clears throat> on the practical side, all a court is <clears throat> is basically the, the, the sovereign sitting on his throne with, surrounded by his courtiers. You know, the people who gravitate to the center of power. So, <coughs> so, the thing is, is that in the traditional perspective of what a king is or a dictator is, you have this story, this scenario. The king is sitting on his throne and he's looking out the window and he sees some knave out there stealing oranges off of his favorite orange tree. So he does the kingly thing. He sends the guard out, picks the guy up, throws him in the dungeon. Okay? That's all. Very simple. After all, he's the king. <coughs> well, what happens after that is on dungeon visiting day, the, uh, the knave's brother visits him. And he complains to his brother about how unfairly he was treated. He, he really didn't, uh, nobody heard his side of the story. And, and so it, it's unfair that he get three years of prison time, dungeon time, and so forth. And of course the brother, being a brother, is very sympathetic. And he says to him, he says, well, he says, uh, yeah, that's a bad deal, he says, I'll take care of this for you. And that night, because the brother turned out to be the chief cook, the king dies of an overdose of arsenic. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's how, that's, things, that's how things got settled, you know, sometimes. Well, that's a bad deal for, for uh, kings. So we got this court system. Now just, let's recast the scenario. <clears throat> King's sitting on his throne, he looks out the window, and he sees some knave stealing oranges off his favorite orange tree. So far the story is the same. So he sends the guard out. The guard goes out, picks up the guy, brings him before. They accuse him of doing this. They ask him how he pleads. They get the various witnesses, they set up the procedure, they make an announcement, a public announcement, we're going to have this trial on a certain date. Everybody shows up at the trial, including the, the uh, knave's brother, the chief cook. And they have the trial, they present the evidence, and then they have a decision, if necessary, maybe have a jury out there, you know, to, to look at it and so forth. Then they convict him, and then he gets his three years in the dungeon, <laughs> okay? Now, the, uh, uh, on dungeon visiting day, the brother visits the uh, prisoner, and the prisoner complains about it, what an unfair deal it was, how he didn't really do it, and, and so on. And, and the brother says, look, bro, he says, I attended your trial. I saw the evidence. I said, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, but you're, you know, <laughs> you kind of earned it. And so, as a consequence of that, the king gets to live another day, arsenic-free day, <laughs> okay? So what I'm pointing out here is that the number one purpose of a court, above all the other things that you've heard, all the things you've read about, all the court rules and procedures and everything else, the number one thing about a court is that it is a stage upon which the sovereign puts a show to convince the rest of the world that the sovereign is right. That's the purpose of a court, okay? Nothing can violate that rule. I don't care what the, what 
what goes on in the courtroom and so forth, that is the number one rule you never violate. You must put on a good show. 